Probably a lot of times we choose our treatments based on side effects and safety concerns. That's kind of what I find when, when you don't have clear evidence that one is better than the other, a lot of times that's how we think. So even our piperazole and quetiapine, we know have differing side effect and risk profiles. So that may help you choose between those. And then here we have clearly the least toxic option. Okay, what about switching? There's no evidence to support one aging class over another. You know, going from an SSRI to what's your next step, going from an SNRI to the next step. Here again, we know that some patients will do very well with one mechanism of action versus another, but it's trial and error at this point. We just don't have the biomarkers or the biologic tests that would help us to select, and that's frustrating. I always joke, if we can do a blood test, like a genetic test, you know, and say, oh, you need an SNRI, then we would be just like a real doctor, wouldn't we? You know, that joke is so funny at night. I don't know what it is about the morning. It's never very funny. Yeah, thank you for the token. Uh, I appreciate it. Okay. Learning can be fun. I, I maintain that. It's kind of like business ethics. It's not necessarily an oxymoron. Learning is fun. Okay, crickets. Very nice. Got a drum roll over there, maybe? A rim shot for me? Okay, let's keep moving. Okay, so you can switch within the same class. So, for instance, from one SSRI to another, you know, there is some kind of anecdotal evidence that that is reasonable to do. Um, I would say that the SSRIs as a class are a little more similar than, say, the atypical antipsychotics as a class. They vary quite a bit. But clearly we know there are some differences, so it's, it's reasonable, as opposed to switching to another class. Uh, you know, it seems to me that if you're treating with an SSRI, rather than trying SSRI after SSRI, you might consider trying a different class. But there isn't good data yet to, to tell us what to do. Common switch options from an SSRI or an SNRI would be over to bupropion, which is non-serotonergic, or to mirtazapine, which is a unique mechanism I'm sure you're familiar with. However, <laughs> we have some underused options. Now, when I started training in psychiatry, it was the late 1980s, and we used to try cyclics and monoamine oxidase inhibitors quite a bit, because at that point, I mean, I remember Prozac first coming in and being approved in the late 80s was during my residency, and so we were very comfortable. Think about the residents and people who've trained since then, especially in the 2000s or the late 90s when we had all of these new antidepressants, and we get a lot of promotional activity and education, and our good old friends tricyclics and monoamine oxidase inhibitors, which are now generic, most of them, they sort of get left out. And I'll never forget a very wise professor of mine, John Buckman at the University of Virginia. John Buckman was one of those grizzled guys who had been practicing before the modern antipsychotics, antidepressants. And he would see, he sort of would sit back, he'd have this bemused smile when all these new drugs would come out and sales reps would come in and promote them and say how great they were. And he would just sit back and he'd go, ah, dirty drugs are better. <laughs> and by dirty drugs, he meant drugs with complex mechanisms of action that had many different mechanisms. I mean, obviously, we'd love to have a very clean, magic bullet kind of approach, but it just, it seems like the brain is smarter than that. And the brain can, can adjust or adapt. You've all heard of the Prozac poop out syndrome, for instance, right? So, I want to encourage you to think about tricyclics and monoamine oxidase inhibitors as options because the other thing John Buckman taught me when we were being sold the SSRIs when they first came out and they were touting similar response rates and this kind of thing, well that may be true, but the remission rates, the magnitude of response may not be similar. John Buckman used to say that all the time. Tricyclics are more potent, they seem to work better. That was his anecdotal experience. Okay, question time. Everybody have your question pads? Got your keypads. All right, how about now? Do you feel competent prescribing tricyclic antidepressants to patients with treatment resistant depression? Vote one if you strongly disagree that you feel competent, and all the way down to five, you strongly agree that you feel competent prescribing tricyclic antidepressants here. Please go ahead and vote. Wow, now you're talking. Blue Monday, new order, very good. Dance version's called At the Beach, by the way. 
All right, I came, I came of age in the 80s. I don't know what he's going to do. Okay, let's see. Well, let's learn a little bit about tricyclic antidepressants. First of all,